thank you very much for coming out to hear this talk uh, and to Mereta for the kind, generous invitation to come to Copenhagen this way uh, and to your screens this way. Um, if not in the other way, we're more used to. Uh, this conference means a lot to me, its subject uh, and its focus, uh, but also because the name of it involves some good English wordplay. Sharing is caring. Okay, let me add that sharing, uh, the way we uh, all mean it, is not the default position for a lot of people. It's not the way they think. So sharing is an act of bravery. It's an act of courage. Sharing is daring. Uh, you know also that sharing involves uh, a lot of mistakes. We've been at it for one, two decades only. Uh, frankly, it involves a lot of experiments, some of which go wrong. Uh, so sharing is erring. Sharing is full of challenges. Uh, it can be exhausting. Sharing, ladies and gentlemen, sharing is wearing. And because so much leadership um, comes from the Netherlands, I love the writing and other work I've been able to do there with Harry Ferwayen at Europeana, uh, for example, Johan Uman at Sound and Vision um, and others. Uh, it seems, you know, that I'm always hungry when I'm there. Uh, so I wanna say that sharing is also, I wanna say that sharing is herring, but that would be ridiculous. Let me make five points about our responsibilities right now. <clears throat> the first is we are at peak information disorder today. We have an epistemic disorder, what some people here describe as truth decay. Just over half of the people who live in the United States believe in angels, okay? Uh, just under half the country here believes in evolution uh, which when you, you look around sometimes, you know, if you go to Washington and look at, you know, some of our political leaders, you do wonder, but uh, more seriously uh, and egregiously, we are in crisis. We have more than half a million people dead because they didn't believe in science, because people they listened to flouted it and disregarded it. Uh, and attacked it. We've caused so much of the damage around the world by circulating and allowing false information uh, to circulate that shame should hang on us from now to the end of time. We also have people dead, killed by others, uh, attacked, dead at their own hand, injured for life, uh, all in political rioting in our capital because thousands and thousands of us didn't believe, circulated big lies, accusing victors in free elections of cheating and stealing. We are in the greatest economic crisis uh, of our lives because again, the, the pandemic has as its twin an infodemic. We have to fix it. The second point is we've seen this before. Unfortunately, it was called the dark ages. I've just written a book which opens with a guy, he became famous, uh, opens with him getting strangled and a guy getting burned at the stake uh, in an auto de fe. It's the same guy. Actually, they're trying to strangle him and then they light him on fire the other way around as one does in the 16th century <laughs> over there. Um, it happened to him because he wanted to share knowledge. He was the uh, original sharer, carer, darer. The book opens in the 16th century. Um, William Tyndall uh, was his name. And his thing was to translate the Bible so people could read it and hear it in ways that the apparatus of the crown and the apparatus of the 
church did not want it read and did not want it heard. I will cause a boy that driveth the plow, he told the priest, shall know more of the scripture than thou dost. Uh, worship back then was like television, but television and newspapers and magazines and the web all together once a week. It was like listening to my talk today and maybe one or two others, but that's all you had for media, God forbid, for representing the outside world for the week. I'd be here at a pulpit reading stuff to you, uh, not, not from my book, but from a book that looked like, you know, uh, this, uh, and no other book every week. If it were my book, that would be great for sales. But no, uh, actually, uh, you could not have your own copy of that other book. You could not buy it. You could not own it, uh, not in the original languages, and especially not in a language like English that you could understand. No, another guy uh, in Tyndall's time gets burnt at the stake also for having the Lord's Prayer in English written on a scrap of paper in his pocket. Anyway, I would be here reading this thing to you, but I would be lying. It would be like you were watching me, but I were Fox News. I would be saying, you have to give money to me. Otherwise, you won't get into heaven. You have to do this. You have to do penance. When the word in the Bible actually originally was to repent, you have to do that. You have to engage in charity. When the Greek word originally actually meant to love. For confess, which is what the church wanted, Tyndall gave us the simpler, more personal, more accurate translation to acknowledge. Tyndall was a genius. Uh, ultimately, his work with the Bible gave the English language as many idioms and phrases as Shakespeare. Um, he knew seven languages, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic. He was completely devout. In fact, when he's in jail, he converts his jailer and his jailer's whole family uh, in Antwerp. Uh, anyway, this system of lies and toxic information, he uh, would have none of it. Uh, so he wades through the entire Bible, from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22, not only owning the thing, upon pain of death, translating the thing upon pain of death, but printing and distributing the translations upon pain of death. And he worked with all the publishing technologies of his day, connecting personally with book designers, paper suppliers, printers, boat captains, horsemen across 16th century Europe, the YouTubes, the websites, the Twitters back then, and he brings the knowledge and the book that contains it into the hands of the people. They chased him down and they killed him for it. So the battle of knowledge against ignorance, truth versus lies is not new. And if you're a curator or a librarian or a professor or an archivist or an author or a bookseller or publisher, you're involved in it. But if you start professing the wrong things, the wrong kinds of things, if you start curating publishing, you know, about the Nakba in Palestine, for example, or publishing the wrong things about the fact that our military shoots and burns civilians in our name, or the fact that our government and communications companies can track and share every move we make, which is true, or you try to make all the academic and scholarly journals, some of them decades old, freely shareable, free to the world. Or if you, you know, are in another country like Alexei Navalny and start publishing truths about Russian government and church corruption, the forces that exist will come for you. They will track you down. They will drive you into exile or madness or prison or worse. So we all need some courage when we share because we are doing the right thing. The third point, 
we've been let out of this kind of darkness before. It was called the Enlightenment. Newton's physics, uh, Montesquieu's laws, Linnaeus's taxonomies, Rousseau's political philosophy, the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Uh, most of it happened on the continent, although we had a couple good years. At the heart of that whole project, there was perhaps no greater offering to truth and reason than the 22 million word, 22 million word encyclopedie that the French Enlightenment philosophers started writing, compiling, and offering to the public in 1750. Something of a miracle, not just from a content assembly perspective, an effort to gather all the world's knowledge and print and publish it, but also from a socio-political one, given all the powerful forces suppressing knowledge that such an effort at that time would provoke. The encyclopedia found the state and the church banning at one time or another almost every one of its 72,000 articles, 18,000 pages, 28 volumes, and invoking a hundred ways to forbid its distribution. The act of doing this to compile all the world's knowledge and pack it into one place that could be published, distributed, shared was mind blowing. But so was what was inside. The encyclopedia smote all the 18th century orthodoxies. No proposition can be accepted as a divine revelation, they wrote in the article on reason, if it contradicts what is known to us, either by immediate intuition, as in the case of self-evident propositions, or by obvious deductions of reason, it would be ridiculous to give press preference to such revelations. The entry for fortune spotlighted the gross inequalities of wealth already evident in 18th century Europe. In the article on the slave trade, they wrote, and this is the 1750s, mind you, the purchase of Negroes to reduce them into slavery violates all religion, morals, natural law, and human rights. But even more, the encyclopedists announced from day one that their giant project would be, as we say today, fact-based. How? There would be uh, an underlying and overarching commitment to the verification of all source materials. Verification is a long and painful process, Diderot wrote in his uh, introduction to the whole enterprise, the famous preliminary discourse. We have tried as much as possible to avoid this inconvenience, he said then, by citing directly in the body of the articles, the authors on whose evidence we have relied and by quoting their own text when it is necessary. What this meant in practice was revolutionary there would be no accepted truths, but for those that could be proven and cited. So where does your work, our work, the stuff we have to share and the ways in which we share it fit in to the life cycle of fact-based knowledge? I think verification is a key to getting us out of this mess. Diderot's commitment to reference, to citation, to verification continues in the Enlightenment's most important successor project, Wikipedia, founded by Jimmy Wales and his colleagues 20 years ago this year. It's the foundation of what today's Wikipedia terms verifiability. And in many key ways, once again, it is likely to be the foundation for truth in knowledge and society today. Verification, Wikipedia writes, in its statement of policies, means that material added to Wikipedia must have been published previously by a reliable source. Editors may not add their own views to articles simply because they believe them to be correct and may not remove sources views from articles simply because they disagree with them. Verifiability is a necessary condition, a minimum requirement for the inclusion of material, though it is not a sufficient condition. It may not be enough. Wikipedia, of course, is one of the world's most popular websites, uh, the world's most popular non-commercial one, and an irreplaceable source of verifiable information open to any and all. 
The Internet Archive is another. It's actually working together with Wikipedia now, digitizing books so that links to sources in Wikipedia link all the way through to the, book themse the books themselves and render images and text on the cited pages. So a Wikipedia article on Martin Luther King Jr., for example, in such an article, the reference link to a biography of Reverend King by Taylor Branch, now hot links to the entire readable book online. That work is essential. Can we take verifiability further now, especially as our epistemic crisis deepens? Information about vaccines, literally a pox on our house now, about elections, can we improve citation for the medium that's beginning to overtake us all, which is video? Can we make resources on the web verifiable? What is a citation like? What does it sound like in a, in a podcast? It's super important. The use of footnotes and the research techniques associated with them, as Princeton's great historian Anthony Grafton writes, makes it possible to resist the efforts of modern governments, tyrannical and democratic alike, to conceal the compromises that they have made, the deaths they have caused, the tortures they and their allies have inflicted, which takes us kind of back to where we started. My fourth point, and most important point, um, consider the things we want to share, the direct objects of what we are sharing, the image of an artwork, a photo, a manuscript, a musical score, metadata, an artifact, a wall card, a museum catalog, sounds, moving images, property. Uh, that's the term we use for it, in intellectual property. The copyright law that first came around to describe all this stuff, the statute of Queen Anne, also came around during the Enlightenment. At the same time as Montesquieu and Rousseau and Jefferson were getting busy, and at the same time as Isaac Newton was formulating his laws of motion while observing apples uh, while at home in his orchard during a plague like this one we're having. And just as Newton figured out that apples fell to the ground, ultimately because of gravity and the laws of motion, so the people who wrote Queen Anne's law and most of the laws that have followed recognize that when all is said and done, when all the licenses have expired, an idea, a human creation, art, culture, science, also fall by their nature into the public domain. There's a physics of intellectual property, which I talk about a bit in here, uh, that should give us some hope. There's a natural order to things the state of nature of all the things that we curate, perhaps, is ultimately the commons. Sometimes we just have to give it a little push to get it there. And let me close uh, in that light to say, fifth and finally, we have a, a real, really important uh, and new responsibility now to make knowledge, real knowledge, verifiable, verified information as viral as the lies that we read and hear today. We have to band together all of our knowledge institutions. There is no different uh, to a Visigoth, a Vandal, a Hun, or to a Viking between a museum curator and a librarian or an archivist or professor or public radio producer. We are all of these things. In fact, we are all public broadcasters now because of the uh, medium of the internet that, that's at our, our disposal. We have to re-examine our terms of service agreements with the technologies we use, with the publishers and producers we work with, and especially with our constituents, wherever uh, we are, wherever they are. We have to create some new covenants with our readers, with our visitors, with our viewers. The old social contract that we have uh, articulated by Rousseau and all these guys, uh, that contract, that general contract is 
tearing. And I hope that we can find uh, some way to be sharing with some daring when we are caring the next time that we all meet in person. Um, in the meantime, thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts um, with you. Uh, thanks for the time again and over uh, to you.